Nations Foundation. Thank you very much for tuning in to watch this final presidential debate tonight. Our previous debate a few weeks ago with Larry King drew millions of viewers, giving U.S. and worldwide viewers access to candidates that are ignored by most of America's corporate media. I'd like to thank RT America for hosting the debate, for providing an open platform, for sharing independent views and that are suppressed by mainstream media, for broadcasting this debate internationally, and for providing a neutral feed so networks across the country and globe can also broadcast the debate. Thanks also to our international media who are airing the debate from countries like Sweden, China, Switzerland, Russia, and Israel. I'd also like to thank our political correspondents for taking part in this important debate and our sponsors for helping us promote the debate. They all represent a diverse group of honest media organizations and individuals spanning all types of political ideologies. There are 27 people running for president and I wish we could have them all here tonight. I'm here because my father was shut out when he ran for governor of Illinois. Ron Paul and Ralph Nader have been an inspiration for free and equal elections to spread fresh ideas and viewpoints and to inspire others to join our growing movement of peace, unity, and prosperity through electoral reform. We regret that they could not be here tonight, but know they are here in spirit of this debate. The debate questions we received from the public were so thought-provoking and honest. They helped us come up with the final questions tonight. We only wish we had more time to cover all the issues. Now I'd like to introduce my co-moderator for tonight's debate, the best-selling author, nationally syndicated, syndicated radio host, and host of The Big Picture, Tom Hartman. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Christina. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to the candidates, Governor Gary Johnson and Dr. Jill Stein. Yeah. Tonight's debate will be 90 minutes. We'll be divided into seven questions, plus a few more if we have time. We'll begin tonight with a two-minute opening statement from each candidate. Afterward, each candidate will have three minutes to respond to each question, plus two minutes each for a rebuttal. They will also have seven two-minute rebuttals e each that they can use whenever they want or on whatever question they prefer. At the end of the debate, both candidates will have a chance to make a two-minute closing statement. It was determined to, before the debate that Governor Gary Johnson goes first. Governor Johnson, your opening statement. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, this country is in big, big trouble. And the issues facing this trouble, uh, the issues facing this nation, are something that we can't bury our heads in the sand over. So for starters, let's, uh, let's not bomb Iran. Let's stop with our military interventions that have us with hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that but for our military interventions would otherwise not exist. So let's get out of Afghanistan tomorrow, bring the troops home. I believe that marriage equality is a constitutionally guaranteed right on par with civil rights of the 60s. Let's end the drug war. Let's legalize marijuana today. I would have never signed uh, the National Defense Authorization Act allowing for arrest and detainment of you and I as U.S. citizens without being charged. I would repeal the Patriot Act. I think we need to balance the federal budget now. Uh, and that means addressing the entitlements, Medicaid, Medicare. That means addressing military spending. I think the biggest threat to our national security is the fact that we, we are borrowing and spending money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we're spending. When it comes to jobs, let's eliminate income tax, corporate tax, abolish the IRS, replace all of that with one federal consumption tax. Uh, I am advocating the fair tax, which I think is the answer to tens of millions of jobs being created in this country because we are talking about a zero corporate tax rate environment. It ends up being cost neutral over a very short amount of time. It's really the answer when it comes to American exports because we're going to bleed existing non-transparent taxes out of what we export. It's the answer to China. And then given the opportunity, I would abolish the Federal Reserve if that were legislation that Congress would pass. It's an inside job that the Treasury prints money, gives it to the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve gives it to the banks at 0%. Do the banks give it to you or I? No, they buy up treasuries in a closed loop making profits off of you and I. 
Well, thank you. And uh, Ms. Dr. Jill Stein, your opening statement, please. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and thank you so much to RT and, and Free and Equal. Uh, the American people certainly are at the breaking point. But in this election, we can turn that into a tipping point and start to take back our democracy and the peaceful, just, green future we deserve. We are in crisis now. We are, the American people are losing our jobs, decent wages, our homes, affordable health care and higher education. Our civil liberties are under attack and the climate is in an accelerated meltdown. The wealthy few are making out like bandits, doing better than ever, while everyday people are being thrown under the bus and the political establishment is actually making it worse, imposing austerity on everyday people while they squander trillions on wars for oil, Wall Street bailouts and tax breaks for the wealthy. That's why it's time to stand up and make your vote count and vote green in this election. Every vote for my campaign is a vote for the solutions that the American people are clamoring for right now. That means an emergency Green New Deal to create 25 million jobs, end unemployment, and jumpstart the green economy that spells an end to climate change and makes wars for oil obsolete. We're calling for health care as a human right through Medicare for All that covers everyone while it saves us trillions of dollars over the coming decade. And we're calling for bailing out the students, not the banks. We can end student debt and make public higher education free as it should be, and it pays for itself. We know that from the GI Bill, where it returned $7. For every dollar we invested, we got $7 back in benefits to the economy. So we can end the failed racist war on drugs, downsize the military, end the drone wars, bring the troops home by standing up for this now. These are the solutions we deserve. They are within our reach. We just need to stand up and insist that we have them now by voting green in this election. Thank you, Dr. Thank Stein. You. That was brilliant. Today, a factory, our first question, today a factory in Freeport, Illinois, that belongs to Sensata Technology, literally today, right now as we speak, is being shut down, and more than 170 American workers are watching their jobs shift to China. This is more than a domestic jobs issue. It's an international trade issue. Over the past 10 years, 50,000 American manufacturing factories have been shut down, and 5 million manufacturing jobs have been lost in the last decade. Is free trade really in the best interest of the United States? And would either of you support more protectionist trade policies to stem the loss of American jobs? Dr. Stein? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're seeing in Sensata, in that experience where Bain Capital actually invested in Sensata and is now sending those jobs overseas, nearly 200 jobs. Uh, and it's not that they're making, that they're not making profits, they actually are making profits. It's just that greed has no bounds. Bain Capital seems to be in the business of buy it, strip it, flip it, send it overseas, harvest uh, 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 additional profit, and uh, throw the uh, people and the workers and the community under the bus. Unfortunately, it's the free trade agreements that enable the Bain Capitals of the world to steal our jobs and send them overseas. So, you know, some would lay it at Mitt Romney's feet, but Barack Obama bears an equal responsibility for actually expanding these free trade agreements. And right now, there is a trans-Pacific partnership negotiated as we speak behind closed doors. Even Congress is not able to know what's going on in this agreement. And, but it has been leaked, and what we know is that it will continue to offshore our jobs, continue to undermine wages here at home, and in fact undermine American sovereignty as well, because this free trade agreement actually gives the power to an international corporate board to decide what, what regulations and what legislation we have passed in this country passes muster with them. So they, in a sense, retain veto power over our legislation. This is a direct attack on American sovereignty, as well as a real attack on our economy. So in fact, we need to change these free trade agreements, not only stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but go back to NAFTA, 
brought to us by Bill Clinton. Go back to the Colombia, the South Korea, and the Panama trade agreements negotiated by Barack Obama, which expand this problem. We need to turn the free, so-called free trade agreements, which are free if you are a corporation, but which are incredibly costly if you are a human being. We need to change the free trade agreements into fair trade agreements that actually protect workers, that protect the environment, that protect our communities. And uh, fundamentally, this is how we grow our economy, through a Green New Deal, which will in fact create the jobs here and put our dollars into creating those jobs right now that at the same time can put a halt to climate change and make wars for oil obsolete. So we can get the global economy and the local economy in particular back on track by investing in American jobs and putting a halt to this outsourcing and sending our jobs overseas through the free trade agreements. Governor Johnson. Well, uh, first of all, I think free trade is really a good thing. So let's uh, separate free trade from jobs. Uh, free trade is the notion that uh, goods and services cost less because of competition and who benefits from goods and services costing less? You and I as consumers. So I'm an absolute advocate of free trade. I think that so much of the criticism of free trade actually ends up to be a criticism of crony capitalism which is alive and well in this country and so much of the criticism of free trade has to do with government giving advantages to individuals, groups, and corporations that are willing to pay for loopholes, if you will. So when you talk about jobs overseas, uh, how about creating a business environment in this country uh, that's going to be inducive to bringing jobs back to this country, and that would be reducing the corporate tax rate in this country to zero, eliminating corporate tax, eliminating income tax, uh, abolishing the IRS uh, in this environment, in a zero corporate tax rate environment, millions of jobs will flock back to the United States because of a zero corporate tax rate environment. Tens of millions of jobs will get created in this country because of a zero corporate tax rate environment. Foreign investment capital, which has declined dramatically, when I talk about foreign investment capital, I'm talking about, let's say, Volvo that wants to expand its operations worldwide. Are they doing it in the United States? Absolutely not, because of a 35% corporate tax rate environment. We need to get back to a corporate tax rate that corporations in this country started out with, which was zero. There was no corporate tax. Let's get back to that corporate tax. We will see these jobs flock back to the United States as opposed to a decline in foreign investment capital, we'll probably see a six-fold increase in foreign investment capital if we go to a zero corporate tax rate environment. So let's create the business environment in this country most conducive to jobs, and it doesn't have to do with government giving out this or that loophole. It has to do with government getting out of the way, creating a level system or playing field for everybody and just watch what happens. Millions of jobs will be created in this country. Jobs will not be going overseas. Well, Dr. Rebuttal? Yes, yeah. if you may, two minute rebuttal. Great, thank you. So it's important to look at where we've actually gone because in fact the corporate tax rate has been reduced markedly over the past several decades. Uh, following the Second World War, corporate taxes were a substantial portion of the tax base and they've been cut certainly more than 50 percent, more like about 80 percent. And what we've actually seen, it's important to take stock of where we're going because where we're going is really quite a state of emergency. We've gotten to a point now where so much wealth and power as taxes on corporations and the wealthy have been slashed more and more money and power has actually concentrated in the hands of very, very few. And let me give you the picture of what that looks like. If you had 100 people in the room now representing the American public, and you had 100 loaves of bread representing our total wealth, where we've gone now progressively as we've cut taxes on the wealthy and corporations, and as the free trade agreements have sent jobs overseas and undermined wages at home, here's where we've gotten. 
the top 1%, which would be one person in that room of 100 people, now has 40 loaves of bread. Out of the 100 loaves, 40 belong in the hands of one person now, and 50 people in the room, who are the worst nourished to start with, have all of one loaf of bread to share among them. And this is the trend that we've seen, unfortunately, increasing under the system, which is why we call for fair trade agreements, we call for living wages, we call for reversing this terrible trend in which the top couple percent keep gaining in wealth. 92% of all income gains went to the top 1% in the last uh, four years under Barack Obama. Uh, and instead, the average wages of workers have been slashed. So we need to turn that around by restoring the tax rates of the very wealthy and corporations so we have a more equitable economy that can wor start working for everyone once again. <laughs> you would like I just to have to say that whatever we tax, we get less of. So in this case, we're taxing income, so we're getting less income. Look, we've got the second highest corporate tax rate, second highest corporate tax rate in the world. That's why jobs are leaving the United States, not coming to the United States. You've got Obama and Romney arguing over whether the tax, uh, the corporate tax rate should be dropped from 27 or 25, both arguing that uh, this will create more jobs. I agree with them, but how about zero? How about eliminating corporate tax? Uh, how about eliminating income tax? I am talking about the fair tax. It ends up being uh, revenue neutral, so we still have to balance the federal budget. Um, look. I think that if we continue on our spending path in this country that we're going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse. So it's twofold. We've got to cut federal spending by $1.4 trillion. We enact the fair tax, like I say, I think tens of millions of jobs get created in this country. Uh, o Obama and, um, and Romney are arguing over lowering the uh, corporate tax rate by nibbles. Let's just get rid of it. Create a level playing field, do away with the IRS, imagine no deductions, imagine how simplified our lives become, uh, not having to comply with IRS uh, regulations, and how easy it will be uh, to administer and collect one, one federal consumption tax. Right. If you would like rebuttal to use back. your second of seven rebuttals. Go okay, ahead. sure. sure. Um, if you think that more of what's not working will make it better, then sure, go ahead and vote for it. But if you think it's kind of broken right now, probably more of cutting taxes on the wealthy and corporations isn't going to do it for us. But here's what has a track Can record of actually this? working. Can I just interrupt this? going on, or is this uh, I, I think, part of the, I, I I'm sorry. Okay. All right. We, sorry. We sorry, Joe. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, let's, you know, let's, let's look at what has worked. Uh, and in fact, when you look at the national debt, the national debt skyrocketed for a couple of reasons. One was wars for oil that were not paid for, that were put on sort of the national credit card. Another is the Wall Street bailouts. Uh, another is the tax breaks for the wealthy. Um, and, and a big part of what crashed the economy, I should mention uh, expanding health care costs, and I, I hope we'll have a chance to come back to that, because there is a very good solution for that. And in a nutshell, that's Medicare for all, which actually stops the waste, the massive wasteful private health insurance bureaucracy, and reduces our health care costs by trillions of dollars over the coming decade. Uh, but also just because we're on the economy now, I want to address how the economic collapse brought to us by the deregulation of Wall Street and the waste, fraud, and abuse that was perpetrated on the economy that deprived American families of 40% of their wealth, their savings, and so on. We need to jumpstart that economy and get it going again. That's what the Green New Deal is all about. It has a track record of success based on the New Deal that profoundly got us out of the Great Depression. And the idea was where the private sector could not and would not create those jobs, that government would step in to create those jobs where needed in order to jumpstart the economy, get those revenues going again, and help to erase our national deficit and debt. Are we done? Okay. So moving on to the second. <laughs> well, look, it, it, it's baloney. It's rebuttal? absolutely baloney. Tax, corporate tax rates have been going up. 
Um, I, I would just ask the question, why not take corporate tax rates to 70%? Why not just take it all the way straight to 100%? Why should there be co corporate profits at all? Well, the answer is, is that initially this country was about zero corporate tax rate. Corporations are owned by individuals. When when uh, income gets distributed to the owners of corporations as individuals, that's where that was taxed at. I would argue let's get rid of income tax completely, that whatever we tax we get less of. Uh, and in this case, going to a zero corporate tax rate environment is in the opposite direction of where we've been going, which is higher corporate tax rates, with, which have us with jobs flocking away from the United States as, opposing to, as opposed to being in the United States. So move on to the second question. Ready? All right. You could stay on this one all night. <laughs> yeah. <Sure>. So now, <laughs> we, uh, now we go to Matt Welch, second question, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine, who is going to read a viewer question on the global financial system. The economic collapse in 2008 set off a global economic crisis, demonstrating the interconnectedness between distinct national markets. We saw this dynamic with this year's LIBOR rate rigging scandal, which could have affected hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets worldwide. Are you concerned about the size and lack of checks and balances of the international banking system? Would you make any reforms to rein in the powers of Wall Street, the Federal Reserve, and the rest of the global financial system? Governor Johnson? Look, I think the reason, uh, no. Um, I don't think it's an issue of regulation or laws. It's the fact that uh, Wall Street made some incredibly bad decisions that they but should have been rewarded for those decisions by having been allowed to fail. Uh, and that's what didn't happen. Uh, in this, uh, in this um, endeavor of mine, running for President of the United States, I've surrounded myself with a whole lot of free market economists that to a person uh, say that there would not have been a system-wide collapse, that we should have established the bottom. And again, government stepping in has basically uh, blown up assets or inflated assets. So we have the Federal Reserve that is currently buying up assets whatever those might be, uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, stocks, um, treasuries. Uh, I guarantee you that whatever they're buying, those, those prices right now are inflated artificially uh, and that they shouldn't be doing this. And yet this is exactly what's happening. And I do believe that if we don't get our spending in check, we're going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse and a monetary collapse, very simply, is when the dollars that we have in our pocket don't buy a thing because of the accompanying inflation that goes along with borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar we're spending. I am livid over the fact that we bail out Wall Street for making incredibly bad decisions that they don't go that that they that they don't lose their money that they're allowed to be bailed out now they're too big to fail and we're paying them bonuses and they're reaping profits off of you and I and they're taking no risk whatsoever capitalism on the way up communism on the way down thank you governor johnson dr jill stein please yeah um, you know the 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 question made the connection between the collapse of our economy here and the global economic uh, collapse crisis, if you will, uh, world over. And, and I think the point is very good, that we really need to start with that waste, fraud, and abuse that took place on Wall Street. And, and it's important to recognize that that did not come out of nowhere. This is a problem that built up over decades as the banks became increasingly powerful uh, and specifically uh, with the deregulation uh, that was brought on under the Clinton administration uh, under the uh, Treasury Secretary um, Larry Summers in fact who repealed or who advocated and succeeded in revealing the Glass-Steagall Act which had separated commercial and investment banks uh, that was put to an end. That was a very important safeguard that was brought to the American people after the last great economic collapse. And that happened, you know, that was what the Great Depression was all about, uh, about the similar waste, fraud, and abuse on Wall Street. Uh, after the Great Depression, those reforms were put in place. 
which protected the economy, protected investors, protected homeowners for decades until that regulation, that safeguard was repealed under the Clinton administration. And then you had a series of crises culminating in the Wall Street crash. Along with that, uh, the, under the Clinton administration, the reckless derivative trading uh, was also established, which would be uh, vulnerable to these predatory loans. They then took those loans and bundled them into fraudulent mortgages and uh, then peddled those mortgages and bet against them. This is why we got the collapse that we did. This is why it's so critical to reinstate. And um, in addition, uh, we need to create state banks that will make the loans, that provide for those investments, that will provide the underpinnings of the Green New Deal, that will bring the jobs back and create a stable and productive and just economy for all of us, the economy that we deserve. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the third question. No rebuttal here. Uh, next up, Metha al Hassan, journalist and University of Southern Provost PhD fellow in American Studios and Ethnicity, who is going to ask a question a viewer uh, asked on U.S. intervention in the Middle East. A viewer wonders, both of you have been critics of U.S. intervention around the globe and have called for immediate withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Does U.S. influence make the world a more or less safe place? And what about women? Dr. Stein. Great questions. Thank you. Well, you know, we can see where this policy has taken us. We deserve a foreign policy based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. Unfortunately, we currently have an international policy based on wars for oil and the use of brute military force uh, as a tool of foreign policy. And we see that this is basically blowing up in our faces right now. We've seen the blowback all across the Middle East with the attacks and the demonstrations against U.S. embassies. Uh, we've seen in Afghanistan uh, where the 2,000th soldier recently lost his life. That soldier was killed at the hands of an Afghani police force that was being trained by that soldier. And we're seeing now many increasing numbers of these deaths where Afghanis are turning against Americans. We've seen recently in Pakistan, where 75% of Pakistanis now identify America, actually, as an enemy, not as a friend. After a decade of war, and after trillions of dollars, over five trillions of dollars spent, thousands of American lives, hundreds of thousands of civilian lives, perhaps millions, what have we accomplished? Well, we don't have stable democracies. Iraq still teeters on the brink of a civil war. Uh, we don't have stable allies. And again, Iraq, recently against the expressed wishes of the United States, was cooperating with Iran on the use of their airspace for Iran to send weapons to Syria. So we've not created stable allies. We certainly have not created um, a haven for women's rights, uh, certainly not in Afghanistan. Uh, not in Iraq either. So, you know, this policy is not working. Uh, we need to change, and, and I might add that the drone wars, which have been so massively expanded under President Obama, on day three of his uh, presidency, he actually intensified the bombing in Pakistan, then spread that bombing to uh, Somalia and to Yemen, surged the troops into Afghanistan, and in fact withdrew from Iraq only because it was George Bush's date of withdrawal. He tried his hardest to extend that date so that the troops might still be there, was unable. We need to end these wars for oil. That policy is backfiring on us. The president did this without any Republicans in the room to force his hand. The Pakistani bombing, in fact, began on day three of the president's term, when he still had the honeymoon effect going on. So we need to say no to these wars for oil. We need an international policy that raises the bar for everyone, including Israel and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. 
all the countries in Yemen that we consider our allies. We need to put them on notice that the United States is adopting a policy based on international law and human rights, and we expect to see uh, cooperation along those principles from all who might consider themselves our allies going forward Thanks. in the future. All right. Thank you. Governor Johnson, please. Well, we should do unto others as we would have others do unto us. That should be the United States' influence. The influence the United States should have should be the beacon on the hill. The notion that we've been the country that stood up to the bully as opposed to being the bully. Well, we're the bully right now. Look, the largest demonstration in the world in support of the United States after 9-11 was in Iran, where over a million citizens showed up in support of the United States. And we're going to bomb Iran? We bomb Iran, we're going to find ourselves with another hundred million enemies to this country that we would otherwise not have. I absolutely believe that because of our military interventions, we have hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that we wouldn't otherwise have. The results are, from our military interventions, are that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians in the countries that we go in and intervene die. Our men in service women die. Our men in service women are coming back with their limbs blown off. This has to stop. Drone attacks right now. I read today that, that drone attacks take out the target or potentially take out the target. But whenever we launch a drone missile, that 2% of its effectiveness is the target. The rest is unintended consequences. So by example, that should be our influence. Our influence should be diplomatic. Our influence should be that we live by example, that we recognize women's rights, that women have the right to make decisions in their lives as all women worldwide should have those rights. But we need to act as an example as opposed to being the bully. All right. We're moving on to the next question. Members of Congress have recently called on the State Department to stop sending foreign aid to countries like Egypt and Pakistan. In your administration, what would the goals of foreign aid be? And are there any specific nations from which you would strip U.S. aid? Governor Johnson? Foreign aid, uh, that poor people in this country give money to rich people in other countries. And contrary to what we all grow up believing, foreign aid doesn't go to poor people in foreign countries. Foreign aid goes to prop up new dictatorships that have taken over from old dictatorships, but the new dictatorships have American interests at heart, and that's why we give out foreign aid. During the last debate, Romney was asked about the $2.5 billion of foreign aid to Pakistan. And his answer was, no, we really shouldn't be fiddling with that $2.5 billion because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Well, what message does that send to a country that doesn't have nuclear weapons? The message that sends is the only way you get United States respect is to have nuclear weapons. Now we're back to the Iran issue. And if you were Iran and the saber rattling that was going on in this country, if you heard that and you felt like we, they were going to be imminently attacked, this is a response that we're generating uh, ourselves. So foreign aid. Foreign aid is something that should stop. We're building roads, schools, bridges, and highways halfway around the planet when we have those same needs here in this country. Uh, let's stop with foreign aid and let's recognize that foreign aid is not as we've grown up to believe it is. Foreign aid is propping up foreign governments that really it's poor people in this country giving to rich people in other countries. The, um, uh, the uh, leadership of Afghanistan, as corrupt as it possibly can be, siphoning off billions of U.S. Uh, foreign aid dollars. These, <clears throat> this isn't foreign aid that's going to the citizens of Afghanistan. It's going to prop up foreign governments that are supposedly in our best interests. Thank you. Dr. Stein? There is a role for foreign aid, but, but regrettably, uh, most of our foreign aid right now is military aid. 
And that form of, of aid comes back to haunt us. As the UN uh, Rapporteur on Human Rights, Navi Pillay, recently said, uh, and, and she was pointing to Syria and the fact that the conflict in Syria had been made so much worse by the fact that arms were flowing in to both sides and escalating what might have been a limited conflict to an all-out civil war. And uh, unfortunately, this is sort of the poster child for what's going on with um, not only military aid, but also the weapons industry, which has been on a real growth curve uh, under the last uh, two years alone, that that uh, exporting of weapons, in fact, has uh, increased enormously to where the uh, international weapons trade now is about 70% uh, coming from the United States alone. So it's very important to recognize that we're actually throwing uh, gasoline on the fires of every ethnic, religious, and national conflict virtually around the world by this very aggressive policy of uh, sending arms all around the world. And much of that is actually happening uh, under the guise of foreign aid. So it, it's very important, I think, for us to end what is the predominant form of foreign aid right now, and that is military aid, uh, and to transition from this foreign policy based on militarism and seeking allies in wars for oil to a foreign policy actually based on international law, human rights, and diplomacy. And one of the most important coalitions, I think, for us going forward is to build a coalition to actually fight the war against climate change. Uh, there was a report recently done by some 20 governments around the world showing that uh, some 400,000 people are killed every year now by climate change. The cost is over a trillion dollars a year, and it's about 1,000 children a day who are actually dying from the effects of climate change. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to build alliances with countries around the world, particularly with China, which has been a leader in developing clean renewable energy, and for us to lead the way, both by example and also through diplomacy, in developing a real international strategy by which we, say we solve this most serious problem that threatens the future of us all on this planet. Johnson, We're funding the Syrian insurgents. A uh, quarter of the Syrian insurgents are jihadists. Did we not learn our lessons when it came to Afghanistan and the fact that we bankrolled Osama bin Laden? And how did that turn out? Look, there are unintended consequences to our military interventions, always worse than better. Uh, Libya. We oust Muammar Gaddafi, we oust his personal army, his personal army goes off to the democracy of Mali, topples the democracy of Mali, we're down one democracy when it comes to that intervention. The fact that we are looking at Iran right now as a potential threat, nuclear threat, well that is an unintended consequence of taking out Saddam Hussein and Iraq. Uh, look. Uh, Iran's only concern was what was Iraq going to do to us today? What was Saddam Hussein going to do us today? to us today? We take them out. Now, potentially, we deal with this uh, as an issue. Dr. Stein, did you want to rebut that or have any comment or, or um, save that time for future? Yeah, well, maybe I'll, I'll add to that. Um, that the, you know, the problem in, so-called problem in Iran, you know, is really uh, emblematic of a very short-sighted uh, foreign policy. And in fact, the, the, the potential for Iran to acquire nuclear weapons, uh, you know, at this point it's, it's a potential, but it is not actually a reality at this point. However, there are countries in the Middle East who do have nuclear weapons right now, who are outside the limits uh, of the non-proliferation treaty, and that includes Israel, and that includes Pakistan, and that includes India. So it pays to have an even-handed 
and inclusive approach. If we want to solve the problems of nuclear proliferation, we need to start by creating a nuclear-free Middle East. And that means not only abolishing nuclear weapons starting in the Middle East and going around to include all of us around the world, uh, but it means also addressing the threat posed by nuclear power. Because in fact, every nuclear power plant produces enough plutonium every year to create dozens of nuclear bombs. So as long as you have nuclear power, you have not only the danger, especially which is accelerated now with climate change because both drought and flood um, uh, put nuclear power plants at grave risk, but in addition, uh, you have the threat of nuclear proliferation. So we need a nuclear-free Middle East as the starting point to create a nuclear-free planet uh, and a nuclear-free world, free of the nuclear weapons as well as the nuclear power plants that now pose such an increasingly grave danger uh, in this era now of increasing uh, out-of-control climate change. Okay, now we go to actor and comedian Sam Cedar, and I'd add my good friend and colleague who's going to read a viewer question on climate change. Hurricane Sandy has compelled the mainstream media to talk about climate change. Do you believe climate change is man-made? And what should the government's role be in curbing climate change, if any? Dr. Stein? Uh, great question, Sam. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, climate change is here, and it's happening, as we saw uh, just last week with Hurricane Sandy, the biggest uh, storm ever to hit our shores and uh, that is coming then on the heels and I should mention with Hurricane Sandy now we are seeing tens of thousands of people who are homeless as another storm uh, approaches leading to freezing weather while there are 40,000 people in New York uh, looking for shelter and there are many many more who still do not have electricity there is a shortage of gasoline, uh, in part because some of the uh, refineries have been knocked out and the pipelines. So again, we are seeing how very vulnerable our fossil fuel supply is, this very, uh, this very thing which is causing the climate problem in and of itself. And um, I should add that the crisis with Sandy is coming on the heels of the hottest 12 months on record, the, um, the worst floods, the worst drought impacting 60% of the United States uh, for many areas the second year in a row, causing food prices substantially to increase both here and around the world. Uh, we're looking at unprecedented melting now in the Arctic, many decades ahead of schedule. The science, in fact, has, has its fault has been that it has far underpredicted the severity of this crisis. Uh, as the cover story in the, um, uh, the economics magazine uh, said this week, it's the climate, stupid. You know, in fact, we need to go beyond that. And they were talking about Sandy, that it's the climate. It's not only the climate. We've got to get beyond recognizing the climate. We've got to get to the fossil fuels that are causing the climate crisis and then, in fact, get to the politics that's causing the fossil fuels to take down our climate. We've got a fossil fuel politics which is driving the climate crisis. And that's as much a part of the Democratic Party and President Obama's agenda as it is Mitt Romney's and his agenda. That's why the solution to the climate crisis is fundamentally standing up and making your vote count for the real solutions to this climate crisis. That means a Green New Deal that will create 25 million jobs end the unemployment crisis while we transform the economy to the green economy that can actually put a halt to climate change and make wars for oil obsolete. This is a win-win, and you can stand up and move those solutions forward by voting green. I am the only candidate in this race that will solve the problem of climate change. If you want to solve that problem and not go forward uh, on this trajectory towards climate disaster that we're not now on, go to the polls and vote for a green solution uh, on November 6th, and let's put a halt to climate change right now. Governor Johnson, your, your response to Sam? 
Well, I do believe uh, in climate change. I do believe that it's man-caused. Uh, that said, as President of the United States, I don't think that I'm personally going to affect climate change. I don't think I'm personally going to be able to change a hurricane from landing in a particular uh, area. I think that a good environment is a direct result of good economy, that that's the number one factor when it comes to a good environment. I think as consumers, we are demanding less carbon emission, and in fact, we are getting less carbon emission in this country. Now, I do say this country because we do have developing countries where regardless of what we do, uh, I think we're going to see continued increased uh, carbon, carbon emission worldwide. I am against cap and trade. I think that it would devastate the economy. And uh, I understand that if we would have implemented uh, cap and trade, that it would have set criteria or set upper limits of carbon emission that we're going to actually beat uh, by the year uh, 2020. Uh, we are demanding less carbon emission. We're getting it. Uh, energy will be cleaner in the future, less carbon emission, just as there is less carbon emission today as opposed to years ago, decades ago. It's something that we're demanding, and effectively, that's how we're going to arrive at less carbon emission. Governor Johnson, if, if the two of you agree that we have man-made climate change and that it's whacking us, What's the appropriate role of the federal government, and more specifically the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, in responding to that? Well, first of all, uh, as a libertarian, I, I want to point out that I think that uh, FEMA could be drastically reduced in size and that uh, contracts could be prearranged when it comes to responding uh, to these emergencies. Uh, I absolutely see a role when it comes to the federal government in coordinating response to federal emergencies uh, in the case of bring, being able to bring in uh, tankers, for example, for fire suppression. Uh, in the case of, uh, of gasoline right now in the New York, New Jersey area, I kind of have to chuckle at the fact that there is a gas shortage, but the, it, does the gas shortage have to do with government stepping in and saying that there can't be any price gouging. Well, what the heck? How about the notion of $7 a gallon gasoline in, in a situation where people are standing in line for six hours? There may be a lot of people that would want to stand in, or that would want to pay $7 for a gallon of gasoline. And the notion of gasoline trucks, and I, I'm not a technician here, but this is where government gets in the way and prevents real live solutions to these problems. What about the notion of a, of a gasoline truck that actually had a uh, dispensary on the truck that could actually dole out gas in a safe way, leave that to the private sector and it would happen. But I'm just saying, if the government took the opposite response to gasoline prices in this case, there wouldn't be any shortages right now in the New York, New Jersey area because entrepreneurs would be driving gasoline trucks into the area to respond to the problem. I use that as just one example of probably dozens of examples on how there could be better response uh, given more of a private sector uh, access to be able to do that. Dr. Stein, is the, is the free market the solution to, to large disasters? Uh, you know, if it is, I think we haven't seen it yet. So it would be the first time, and that would be remarkable. Uh, yes, of course there's a role here, a role only that government can play. Uh, it needs to be a better, do a better job, but, uh, you know, fundamentally we need government to be able to come in with FEMA, uh, provide the food, provide the water, provide the housing, provide the emergency assistance and the fuel. Uh, I'm afraid that's the only way we're going to deal with this. But it's very important for us to talk about the role of government in preventing us from having to deal with more and worse of these storms going forward. And it's not only the storms, it's also the rising sea level because it's well established now. It's not just a prediction for the future. It's very clear that those sea levels are rising more quickly. It used to be an inch a decade in the Northeast. Now it's 
it's more than that it's heading towards several inches per decade so whatever these storms are they're going to be far more worse because the uh, shoreline is coming inland which has uh, uh, consequences of its own so um, uh, individual actions, personal responsibility is important, but it hasn't fixed the problem so far. And in fact, our carbon emissions are not going down. They are still going up. They may be going down in certain areas, but meanwhile, we're opening up fracking. We're opening up more offshore oil. The president brags that he's built enough oil pipeline to run around the world. You know, so there's no way our carbon emissions are going down. Our carbon emissions have been going up. We've been aggravating this problem, yet we can fix it. For every dollar we spend, on energy, we can create three times as many jobs uh, in the clean renewable energy and conservation sector as in fossil fuels and nuclear. So there's a win-win here. It's called the Green New Deal. It solves the jobs crisis while it solves our climate emergency and it makes wars for oil obsolete at the same time. We cannot do it without a government that is leading the way and that's not in the pocket of the fossil fuel companies. We need a green politics to get a green climate and a green economy that it will take. Well, I'd just like to say that I think government is absolutely well-intentioned. Uh, nothing that government attempts uh, is not in the context of trying to make things better. But I will tell you that one of the worst emergencies that I faced as uh, governor of New Mexico was the Los Alamos fire, which uh, burned a significant part of Los Alamos. It was local responders, and I mean state responders, that came in and and got control of a, of, of a terrible f uh, And then the federal government came in and, and mopped up after that and did a very effective job of doing that and providing funding. But the cause of the fire was actually uh, a government lit fire that was a controlled burn. And it was response to that controlled burn by the government that actually lit a backfire to take care of the controlled burn that ended up with us in New Mexico having a 25,000 acre fire that devastated a forest. Yeah, I, I would just like to add another point about how the Green New Deal, a real comprehensive and emergency solution uh, to the climate problem, has a number of spin off benefits. Um, and, and I want to underscore emergency. Uh, it's as if the country has been attacked, uh, not just by storm, but by drought and by flooding and by the worst heat that we've seen uh, ever on record. And during the Second World War, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, we had an emergency response. Uh, we had a national mobilization. And we converted, in fact, car factories to bomber factories in order to meet that emergency need. We are actually in no less of an emergency right now. In some ways, it's an even bigger emergency because it's only going to grow and there is no end in sight uh, other than utter catastrophe. And we also know that the clock is ticking on this. We only have so long that we can actually turn this around. So it's very important that we have a major coordinated and concerted response uh, that could include, for example, converting some of our bomber factories into solar factories and into wind factories. This would be a response like what Germany has done recently by creating a solar sector, by having an industrial policy that created incentives, that ensured that there was a market until they actually got that private sector up and running, then they could peel back on the incentives and the supports and they have they were able to bring down the cost remarkably and they were able to increase the number of jobs remarkably faster than their schedule had planned so they actually had to relieve uh, and put an end to those incentives. The program worked so well. So this is actually what we can do. And at the same time, those things that are good for a green economy, that is a local food system, public transportation, and clean renewable energy, which prevents pollution, it turns out that is actually the underpinnings of a health infrastructure at the level of our communities as well. So we can actually get healthier and have less reliance on this sick care system, which is costing us $2 trillion a year through the Green New Deal in addition. Thank you. Thank you.
a rebuttal? Well, there's four well, each. I, I, I just have a question for Dr. Stein, and that would be is that clearly um, you see government as being the solution to our problems. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. Do I understand that you would like to see the government take over the Internet? <laughs> I hear you asking uh, the question, do I support net neutrality? And absolutely I do. Um, I think there are so many viewers out there and so many in the American public who've come to rely on the internet as a fair, open, uh, accessible marketplace a real underpinning of democracy where we can go find out what we need to know where we can do research where we can advertise what we're doing without the interference of private monopolies who want to privatize the internet See, I think and, net neutrality yeah, no, excuse me yeah, net no, neutrality gotcha, is gotcha. very important yeah, very to maintain I think uh, the internet as we know it which is a public good and a public service absolutely I oppose the government government stepping in as the tool of private corporations and I certainly don't uh, promote the government as the solution for everything I'm not an ideologue I'm actually a doctor so uh, you know I don't know very much about ideology and I don't particularly lean in ideological see, directions see, we, I tend to be very practical the, and as a doctor I tend to look at what works and then look for appropriate solutions for appropriate problems. Well, and see, we, we do have a difference in, of opinion here in that net neutrality is actually promoted to be the things that you're talking about, but I would suggest that it's one of those areas of crony capitalism that actually, as opposed to what the government says it will be, it's really promotion of those that are already entrenched in the Internet and have interest and that that interest will in fact grow and become a monopoly as opposed to keeping it free and open. So just a difference in opinion. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Thanks for the nice uh, surprise there. That's what I love about open debate. So moving on to question number six uh, from Amber Lyon. I want to thank Intellectual Television TV for connecting us with her. Uh, the Emmy Award winning investigative journalist and whistleblower is going to read a viewer question on secrecy and WikiLeaks. As commander in chief, do you think organizations like WikiLeaks are a threat to national security? And if you're elected president, what type of secrets would your administration protect? Governor Johnson, please. Well, uh, fundamentally, no, I do not see WikiLeaks as a, as a threat. Um, I believe in transparency. Now, when I say that WikiLeaks is not a threat, to my knowledge, WikiLeaks has not uh, divulged any information that has resulted in any harm to anyone uh, involved in information that has been released. Now, that's uh, that's my understanding. If, in fact, that ends up to be different, well, then that ends up to be a different situation. But I think that transparency is something that is very important. Uh, and as governor of New Mexico, I mean, I did get to serve as two terms, I get, did get to serve two terms as governor of New Mexico, and was transparent. The notion that uh, you tell the truth, you let the chips lay where they may, uh, that people really appreciate uh, issues first, Politics last. Politics has a way of uh, obscuring the truth and uh, let the truth be known. One of the instructions I gave to my cabinet all the time is, let's let the attorneys catch up with whatever it is we might be dealing with, but let's us be out there front line uh, telling the truth on these issues first and foremost, and uh, we'll let the attorneys catch up with the truth. Dr. Stein. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Certainly WikiLeaks, um, to my knowledge as well, has not been a threat to national security. Uh, I believe very much uh, in what Benjamin Franklin said when he said that if we allow, uh, if I can quote him, uh, if we sacrifice liberty for the sake of security, uh, we will wind up losing both. Uh, I think that sacrificing our liberty, that is our right to know what our government is doing, uh, that is part of our right as citizens. And I think there's no greater threat 
to our security than that kind of secrecy. And we saw, for example, one of the effects of WikiLeaks uh, and their disclosures was to clarify the war crimes that were going on as part of the Iraq war, the incredible human rights abuses. And because of those WikiLeaks revelations, the government of Iraq actually refused to extend the stay of U.S. troops uh, beyond what George Bush had uh, negotiated. And though Barack Obama tried to extend their stay, the government of Iraq refused because of these revelations. So I think it's actually a good thing for us to have uh, transparency, especially when, uh, when it reveals crimes that are being uh, conducted by our government secretly behind closed doors. It's very important that we know. And one of the very unfortunate things about the Bush administration and then about the Obama administration is that um, uh, they, in fact, uh, began to hide these things and began to attack whistleblowers. And in fact, uh, Barack Obama used the Espionage Act to incriminate and persecute whistleblowers more in the four years of his administration than all previous presidents combined. So that is contrary to U.S. security and U.S. interests. Likewise, the Patriot Act, which violates our privacy and our civil liberties, is contrary to our security. The National Defense Authorization Act, which violates our fundamental civil liberties, which allows the president to throw basically whomever he wants uh, into jail without charge and without trial, that is a desperate um, attack on our fundamental security. So uh, absolutely, I think we owe uh, WikiLeaks uh, and Bradley Manning, for that matter, uh, a debt of gratitude for their bringing transparency to our uh, national foreign policy, particularly where crimes were being committed uh, against the ultimate interests of the American people. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning Bradley Manning there as well, because uh, that's a very much importance on top of WikiLeaks. So moving on to the next question, uh, finally, uh, we now go to a Facebook question from viewer Lee Hawkins on the rise of the police state in America. Lee writes, what will you do to end the growing police state and accompanying brutality in violation of our rights? Dr. Stein? So. Um you know, the, the violations of our civil liberties that I just mentioned um, are part uh, of those violations of our civil rights and our basic liberties. Uh, I would add to that the uh, authorization of the use of military force where the president has reinterpreted that, uh, that, uh, that legislation in 2001, which uh, sort of created the war on terror. The, the president has reinterpreted that to give him the power uh, not only to imprison people, which uh, is what he can do now through the NDAA, but actually to assassinate anyone, including U.S. citizens. So this is a dreadful uh, attack on our civil liberties. Um, you can add to that this H.R. 347, which was passed almost unanimously by Congress and signed by the President. This is that bill that actually criminalizes uh, our right to protest, that potentially uh, puts people at risk for being arrested uh, simply for standing out to demonstrate, uh, to peacefully express uh, their uh, their concerns and to petition for redress of grievances. H.R. 347 makes it possible to uh, basically declare the ground that they stand on a zone of special security and um, uh, put them into jail and uh, basically make them felons even if they didn't know that the status of that ground they stood on had been changed. We've looked at the use of the FBI and Homeland Security against the Occupy movement. Uh, and the coordination of militarized police forces to violate the civil rights and the civil liberties and especially the First Amendment rights of the Occupy movement. The Occupy movement represents a very important 
um, redress, effort to redress grievances. The Occupy movement represents the abuse of a generation of students who've been turned into indentured servants who are carrying high debt around. The Occupy movement represents one out of every two million people, one out of every two Americans, 50% of Americans who are in poverty or low income and heading for poverty. So it's very important that Occupy and the rest of us have our civil liberties to be able to stand up. And I myself was on the receiving end of some of that homeland security uh, when I recently showed up uh, at the second debate to insist that the debates actually be opened up and include all the candidates who are on the ballot in enough states to actually win the election. And I'm on the ballot in 85 percent uh, of ballots. And I was handcuffed, taken to a secret location, and cuffed tightly to a chair for eight hours uh, as part of standing up. Uh, and uh, being taken into custody under that police state. So unfortunately, it is the flip side of a censored political system. That, again, is why it's so important to stand up in this, in this election. It's not just okay. It's life-saving. It's liberty-saving. It's planet-saving to stand up and vote green in this election. Thank you, Dr. Stein. And I do Johnson. think that we have a growing police state in this country. I think its roots really uh, lie in the drug war. So um, I am going to do everything that I possibly can to bring an end to the drug war. Uh, I would like to see legalization of marijuana occur now. Uh, I think that that actually is going to happen. I think we're at a tipping point on this issue. 50% uh, of Americans now support legalizing marijuana. Why is the number so high? Well, it's because we're actually talking about it. And the more we talk about it, the more we recognize that 90% of the drug problem is prohibition related not use related and that's not to discount the problems with use and abuse but that should be the focus and now in the name of uh, of uh, police state we have the terrorist threat we have the national defense authorization act um, i may have vetoed more bills as governor of new mexico than the other 49 governors in the country combined how does it work with a president that has no aversion to vetoing legislation uh, I would have vetoed the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows for you and I, as U.S. citizens, to be arrested and detained without being charged. I think this is why we fought wars. 30,000 drones flying over the United States. What are they flying over the United States for? I think it's what's growing in the backyard. What are we doing in the backyard? It's a growing police state, quite obviously. Uh, I would have vetoed the Patriot Act. I would have never established the Department of Homeland Security. I think it's incredibly redundant. I would have never established the TSA, uh, the <laughs> airport security. It's the constitution-free zone that so many of us find ourselves in uh, all the time. I would have left airport security to the airlines, to the airports, uh, to states and municipalities. I would have, as I said, never, uh, never established the Department of Homeland Security. The ACLU uh, last December came out with a report card on all of the presidential candidates, and I'm afraid Jill Stein wasn't in that report, but they came out with a report card on all the presidential candidates. ACLU, a group dedicated to civil liberties, a group dedicated to the Constitution, a group dedicated to the first ten amendments of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. 24 Liberty Torches was a perfect score. Mitt Romney and Rick Santorum had zero Liberty Torches out of 24. Newt Gingrich had four Liberty Torches out of 24. Barack Obama had 16 Liberty Torches out of 24. Ron Paul had 18 Liberty Torches out of 24. And Gary Johnson had 21 Liberty Torches out of 24. Something that I'm very proud of, and that's based on my history, that's based on my eight years uh, as being governor, that's based on the things that I have to say uh, about civil liberties. So we do have a growing police state in this country, and let me just offer you up a prediction. Either Obama or Romney are reelected, we're going to find ourselves with a heightened police state. We're going to find ourselves in a continued state of war. We're going to find ourselves in a continued state of unsustainable spending. Vote for me, uh, and you're going to send a message that this is not acceptable. Governor Johnson, thank you very much. Um, back to foreign policy, if I could. That was the initial focus of our debate here. Um, President Obama has on multiple occasions said that austerity in the Eurozone is creating crises there that are contagious here. 
uh, if not said it in those words, certainly implied it. I'm, I'm curious if you support an austerity measure or an agenda here in the United States similar to that that is being followed in those countries, whether it's in a minor way in the UK or a major way in Greece, and if you can cite any nations that have ever successfully cut their way to prosperity. Well, um, I absolutely believe that we should embark on austerity, that if we don't, we're going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse. So I am promising to submit a balanced budget to Congress in the year 2013, which would be a $1.4 trillion reduction in federal spending. That if we don't do that, we're going to find ourselves in a monetary collapse. And a monetary collapse is going to be a horrible situation that we are not immune from given the mathematics of continuing to borrow and spend money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar that we spend. President Obama, in a press conference, says countries in Europe that are doing pretty well are those countries that are borrowing or spending within their means. The problem in Europe is those countries that have spent more than what they should have spent, and that's the problem that exists in Europe. Now, in the United States, we have a situation where the federal government has tools that Europe doesn't. And those tools are that we can hire teachers and firefighters and uh, law enforcement people, i.e., we can print money. So on one hand, he says austerity is, for many European countries, the reason that they're not in trouble. The reason that European countries are in trouble is because they've spent more money than what they can afford and then looks at the United States and says the reason that the states, the, the reason we're in trouble is that we're not spending enough money. That states don't have the leverage or the power that the federal government does. That's why as the federal government we need to print more money uh, and add to the problem. I, I just, uh, I just, I saw that press conference and I was uh, flabbergasted. And with a straight face, uh, he's saying that we should spend more money emulating the countries in Europe that are in bad shape, which he starts out his press conference by saying. Dr. Stein? Yes. Austerity, you know, has a track record. And it's not a good one. If it was to work in this country, it would be the first time. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's a good gamble. Uh, not only are we seeing the countries in Europe uh, just flounder with austerity budgets, but we've been there ourselves before. Back uh, in the 1930s, we were in a recession. Uh, and the efforts to deal with that severe recession in fact were austerity. It was an effort to balance the budget and to cut expenditures. And that in fact successfully tipped us into the Great Depression. So instead of following a, a program that has a track record of disaster, we could actually instead follow a program that has an incredible track record of success. So if you look at what got us out of the Great Depression and in fact has helped us through recessions uh, since then, uh, you know, it was a program of the New Deal that in fact remarkably uh, reduced the unemployment rate. In the first two months of the New Deal, there were four million jobs that were actually created. Now, we could use some jobs ourselves right now to in fact deal with the climate crisis. And on the first day of my term in office, if I were to have the job, I would instruct the Department of Energy, in fact, to undertake a national weatherization and conservation program, which could put potentially millions of people to work within a matter of weeks. And in fact, it's a job that you don't need to have a PhD for, you don't need to have a college degree, in fact, you don't even need a high school degree, because we are seeing these programs succeed. Uh, in many areas around the country uh, among low-income people who don't have high school degrees but who do have extremely high entrenched unemployment rates. So we can put people to work right now in the economies, in the communities that most urgently need jobs, and we can do that 
putting people to work by weatherizing our homes, businesses, schools, government buildings, and so on, uh, and at the same time actually save money. These, the costs of these installations repay themselves within a couple of years. We can also create jobs in the clean um, renewable energy economies in manufacturing wind and solar and geothermal, in constructing the grid, in creating public transportation, including active transportation, so we can safely bike and walk to school and to work and integrate exercise into our transportation system. Uh, and uh, between a healthy transportation, a healthy food system, and pollution prevention, we can create the jobs we need, we can put a halt to climate change, and we can yes. create the real infrastructure for health. This is why we have a win-win-win, which is the alternative to austerity and can jumpstart our economy uh, right now. We don't need to go down that desperation road of austerity that would actually put us in worse straits than Thank we you. are now. And we're moving on to I, our final. I, I just think that's absolute baloney. That's that's just that's absolute baloney. In our own lives, we can't spend more money than what we take in. Nothing is free. There isn't free health care. There isn't free education. It comes at a cost, and the cost is here and it's now. And I think that Americans recognize that we can't bury our heads in the sand. That this needs to be mutual sacrifice on the part of all of us or we're going to find ourselves with a collapsed government. That's what's going to happen. You know, talking about shovel-ready jobs, if shovel-ready jobs are so great government finance, why don't we make those spoon-ready jobs? Why do we have people with shovels? Why don't we have people with spoons? It'll create so many more jobs because we'll only be able to dig with spoons. Medicare right now, you got the two major candidates arguing over who's going to spend more money on Medicare when Medicare is a system that you and I are paying 30 thousand dollars into and we're getting a hundred thousand dollar benefit that's not sustainable it's not sustainable when what you put into a system gets tripled with the payout unsustainable free has a cost we're actually at the point of cost we're at a crossroads here we can continue down this path and we collapse well, we've got uh, we can go to one more question here um, that, or a rebuttal. Do I, do I have time for a, a sure, quick rebuttal? Sure, and then we'll try to do one quick question. Okay, all right, great. Sure. Um, sacrifice, you know, it's really important to ta talk about shared sacrifice because uh, what we've seen is a whole scale uh, pillaging of middle income people and working people and the poor whose resources have been basically shifted up to the top. That's why uh, the top 1% now has 40% of the wealth and the bottom 50% has 1%. So there is enormous sacrifice going on on the part of working people. We want to see that sacrifice also come from the wealthy few, from the multimillionaires and the billionaires whose tax contribution has been cut. So we believe we need an economy that works for everyone, not just for the wealthy few. And so we need to ensure that we actually create jobs for everyone, that will jumpstart the economy. And I should mention that one of the major alternatives to austerity is not only jumpstarting the economy and getting the revenues back in, but it's also uh, transferring this massive, wasteful private health insurance bureaucracy, which puts 30% of every health care dollar into red tape and paper pushing and CEO salaries. Instead, we can transition to a Medicare for all plan, which covers everyone. And instead of a 30% overhead, it becomes a 3% overhead. And under a single-payer system, instead of having this rapid rate of health care inflation, which outstrips all other areas of the economy, you know how your premiums are going up every year markedly, instead that inflation goes away. That is what saves us trillions of dollars over the coming decade. And in fact, it is the alternative to austerity, providing health care for everyone as a human right under Medicare for All. This is what the American people are claiming for and that's what I will deliver uh, as president uh, in the White House thank you thank you and
What great questions. And we're going to go to our final question. A one minute response here. Squeeze this in. This is actually a very hot topic from our supporters throughout the U.S. Uh, the European Union imposed mandatory food labeling in 1997 for genetically modified foods. Do you support Proposition 37 in California? And as president, would you push for federal legislation requiring the labeling of GMO foods? One minute response, please, Jill. Um, it is our right to know what we are eating, especially when that so-called food involves highly experimental and inadequately tested technology. So as a very uh, preliminary step, we must have labeling of genetically engineered food products. Uh, and I would definitely advance that legislation at the national level. But I would actually go beyond that as a physician and a public health advocate who uh, has spent years studying and advocating for a safe environment that's consistent with human health. I actually call for a moratorium on genetically engineered food until it's been established as safe because once this technology is out of the bag and this is already happening, you can't call it back. There are some real warning signs right now in the scientific literature. We need to put it on hold until we understand what's going on. Thank you. Governor Johnson? I think that uh, one of government's fundamental responsibilities uh, can be to educate and by can educate the notion that uh, we should uh, mandate labeling. We should mandate what ingredients there are in food. Uh, I have celiac disease. I can't uh, consume gluten. It makes me sick. It's poison. Uh, so I would not be able to function uh, if it weren't for food labeling. It's very, very important to me. So consumers make their choices, but they make their choices based on having all the information uh, that they want. Uh, genetically modified food should be labeled as such. Okay. As we approach the final minutes of the final presidential debate of the 2012 election season, we go to closing statements. Each candidate has two minutes, and Dr. Stein goes first. Well, you know, uh, we are in many ways uh, at the breaking point for people, the planet, the economy, and our democracy. But we can turn that breaking point uh, into the tipping point, take back our democracy and the peaceful, just, green future we deserve. In this race, I am the only candidate that will tackle climate change, that will provide the jobs, that will jumpstart the green economy, that will put an end to climate change and put an end to unemployment and make wars for oil obsolete. Uh, at the same time that we create a real infrastructure for health by providing healthy food, healthy public transportation, and pollution prevention. So this is a win-win-win. I'm the only candidate that will provide health care as a human right through Medicare for All, which will also save us trillions of dollars in the coming decade. I'm the only candidate that will put an end to student debt, which has turned 36 million students into indentured servants carrying around difficult, unforgiving debt, specially customized for students to lack all of the usual consumer protections. And they're facing 50% unemployment and underemployment. So we owe it to our students as part of our social contract with the younger generation to give them a fair start, a real shot at economic security. Throughout the 20th century, that was a high school degree. Now in the 21st century, that means a college degree. So I am the only candidate who will provide free public higher education, as well as ending student debt. Uh, and like several other of the candidates, I will also put a halt to these wars for oil. Uh, and you can accomplish all of this by going to the ballot box, by going to the voting booth, and voting green in this election. This is the time to stand up. We don't have time to wait four years. It's not just OK. It's life saving. It's job saving. It's climate saving. Vote green in this election. Go to JillStein.org to find out more. Thank you so much. Governor Johnson, your closing statement. I ran two campaigns for governor where I did not mention my opponent in print, radio, or television. I think Americans are desperate to elect a leader in lieu of electing the lesser of two evils. Right now, so much talk is being given to a wasted vote. 
a wasted vote is voting for somebody that you don't believe in. Vote for the person you believe in. That's how you change this country for the better. I am more liberal than Obama when it comes to civil liberties. I'm more conservative than Romney when it comes to dollars and cents. I happen to think that most people fall in that category. I haven't crawled out from a culvert to run for president of the United States. I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, growing a business from a one-person operation, me, to employ over a thousand individuals. I was a two-term governor of New Mexico in a state that's two to one Democrat. I made a name for myself being a penny pincher. I may have vetoed more legislation than the other 49 governors in the country combined. It made a difference when it came to billions of dollars worth of spending. It made a difference when it came to the government telling you or I what we could or couldn't do in the bedroom. It made a difference when it came to the government making decisions for you and I that only belonged with you or I. So I don't know if there's a more important vote right now if you want to register your distaste for what's happening with politics in this country, which is two parties that have morphed into one that aren't addressing these problems at all. Vote Libertarian. 5% of the general election vote tomorrow makes a difference for the Libertarian Party moving forward, making a difference. When it comes to federal matching funds, it would be a game changer. When it comes to ballot access, not having to take up all the time of the Libertarian Party in getting on the ballot in all these states. And right now I'm on the ballot in 48 states. I'm an official write-in candidate in Michigan. Oklahoma wears the crown of shame as keeping third parties out for the third cycle in a row. You can make a difference. I would ask you all to vote for me. You won't regret it. Thank you, Dr. John, or Governor Johnson. Dr. John. <laughs> yeah, I caught myself. Uh, Christina Tobin is the founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. I'd like to turn this over to her to wrap this up. Thank you for pulling I, all this together. I want to thank you, Tom Hartman, for moderating this with me. And uh, RT America, I mean, here we have two candidates running in the United States, and we have this international press. It's just been so powerful and that says a lot and uh, so thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, Governor Johnson and Dr. Stein um, here at Free and Equal Elections I hope everybody were uniting uh, we do foresee the power uh, of the Commission on Presidential Debates coming to an end in the future uh, ballot access barriers will cease to exist there will be no more voter fraud instant runoff voting will be implemented which will result in getting rid of the wasted vote spoiler argument uh, remember, the only wasted vote is a vote for parties and uh, people controlled by private interest money, the ones who have been playing us fools for centuries. But we are awake, we are strong, and we outnumber them. We see a powerful and peaceful movement evolving to regain control of our elections, affecting not only Americans, but the entire globe. So thank you so much, Tom, RT America, candidates, thank very you, much. Thank you. thank you for being here. Jill. Good thank job, Gary, as always. Well done. I will fight for oil, coal, and natural gas. I also promise that I fight every single day on behalf of the American people. Take it, go to Congress, fight for it. I have my own plan. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else, you hear or see some other part of it, and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Jill Stein, Green Party candidate for president, and I approve this message. We're heading into a climate storm. Floods, fire, drought. How did